folks already. So Peter, is Peter dialing in too? I will work on that. <laughs> Billy. I see him. Oh, she's doing much better. There's a come visit. She's working at home. Yes, and I'm looking her. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Sorry, we didn't acknowledge you. <laughs> Trying to get along. No, no, sorry. Going back on mute. <laughs> oh, perfect.
2022 Prosper Portland Board of Commissioners meeting is now convened. Pam, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Platt? Here. Commissioner Stoudemire Wesley? Here. Commissioner Myers? Here. Thank you. Chair Cruz? Here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I have a brief notice to read. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to limit in-person contact and promote social distancing, Prosper Portland is also streaming the meeting electronically as allowed by state law. Prosper Portland has provided access for the public to listen to the audio broadcast of this meeting. The public can also provide written testimony to the commission by e emailing prospercommissioners at prosperportland.us. Again, prospercommissioners at prosperportland.us. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. It's, it's exciting to be here in person, and uh, you know, kind of, kind of shocking, but it <laughs> feels, <laughs> but it feels great. So I hope everybody feels the same way. So good to see everyone. Okay. So first item is commissioner reports. Does anyone have anything they'd like to report? No. Okay. Commissioner Platt. Well, I will uh, make a few comments. Actually, Willie, do you have uh, anything you'd like to say? Uh, not at this time. I'll do it when we're in person after the uh, debrief on the Nashville trip. Great. Okay, thanks. And that's all I was going to mention is that uh, several of us, including Commissioner Myers and uh, Executive Director Branham, uh, attended the um, uh, GPI trip to Nashville. And uh, it was a terrific, uh, terrific best practices trip. And I think we all got a lot out of it. So there'll be more, more to follow on that. All right, uh, next up is the executive director report with Kimberly Branham. Good afternoon, Chair Cruz and commissioners. Great to be with you in person and Willie to have you joining us, uh, sorry, Commissioner Myers to have you joining us um, virtually. This is the first official week uh, of welcoming staff back into the office and we have a new office as everyone can see. Um, so I really wanted just to start by recognizing two groups of uh, staff who've played essential roles in supporting us over the last two years as we went from in-person to 100% virtual to now hybrid. Um, so huge appreciation to the members of the Continuity of Operations team, or COOP as we affectionately call them, um, who've been meeting for the last two years to make sure that we've maintained our business operations and then most recently have been working to make sure that our transition um, back into the office is done in a safe uh, way. Really want to appreciate the co-chairs, Adam Lane and Sean Murray in particular. Also want to appreciate the Welcome Back Committee, uh, Welcome Back Prosper team, which was formed in late 2021. That team is really focused on making sure that we have a positive transition from a cultural standpoint um, and um, thinking about what it's going to mean to be in this hybrid environment, which we're all getting a chance to try out right now. Um, so I want to appreciate the co-chairs, everybody who's on that and the co-chairs, um, Andrea Gall and Dan Spiro. Um, you will too be getting these, but they have, for example, put together this very cool passport to Old Town, which encourages staff to go out and try the fantastic businesses. And if you get enough, then you would be um, entered into a, a prize. So we're really committed to um, supporting Old Town. And I know we're going to hear more about that, but that's a part of um, what the committees have been working on. So. Um, thanks to everybody who's been involved there. I do want to just note finally, though, um, and to acknowledge the critical roles that Debbie Hansen, Mark Paget, and Ann Crispino Taylor have been playing for the last two years. Um, they've been in the office most days, um, enabling us, many of us, to work from home safely. So, huge appreciation to the roles that they've played on behalf of the agency. A couple announcements to make. Um, so pleased to announce that this last Thursday, the Phoenix Pharmacy on Southeast Foster, which came to our board a few months ago, um, held a community open house. The board approved an investment, as you'll recall, of just over a half a million dollars in commercial property redevelopment loans for the project, which celebrates its official grand opening on Saturday, May 7th. I want to acknowledge the Prosper team that's been working really hard for a number of years to support this project. So Oscar Novella, Kay, Kay Little, uh, Wendell Cador, Carl Dinkelspiel, Ember Breckenridge, and Lisa Abwaf. I'm also pleased to note that the building is fully leased up, which is a fantastic sign and will be a huge asset um, for the community. You can find out more information at fosterthephoenix.com. Um, I want to remind viewers that there are two grant opportunities presented by Prosper Portland that are open now and will be closing soon. So the first is the Inspiring Diversity Grant, which will close on Monday. May 2nd, and the Community Livability Grant Program, which closes 
on Friday, April 29th. You can find out more on our website at prosperportland.us. I also want to note that um, we have the return of the Mercatus Momentus event next week, which is a celebration to show appreciation for Portland's diverse business community. It's a really fun event, very festive. Um, and the event is happening Tuesday, April 26th from 5 to 8. You can find out more at mercatuspdx.com to view the complete list of vendors and the presenters. Prosper Portland is also assisting uh, Portland Parks and Recreations in a uh, plan to conduct repairs on the renovation of O'Brien Square located in downtown Portland, not too far from us. We recently issued a request for offers uh, in the sale of floor area ratio development rights for the square. The resulting funds will be reinvested to uh, re help repair the park. We are managing this request for offers and um, really see this as a fantastic cross-bureau collaboration as we're supporting them and using our technical expertise um, and want to appreciate and acknowledge Shelley Hack, Kay Little, Lisa Norwood, Member Breckenridge, and Mangan and Debbie Hansen for their work on um, getting this out. Uh, you can find out more about the request for offers, which closes also on Monday, May 2nd, at prosperportland.us, and you look at for business at the for businesses tab. All right. So last but definitely not least, I'm very excited to introduce two. Um, new colleagues who've recently joined Prosper Portland, and you get to meet them in three dimensions. They're here in our front row. Um, and uh, so I'll start with Catherine Hardinger, who joins the Development and Investment Department as Project Manager on the Green Team. Um, she will be initially focused on the Cully Action Plan. Catherine comes to us from our sister agency, the City's Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, where she was a land use planner for the last 11 years. While there, she worked as an engagement lead on the Central City 2035 plan and went on to manage some really high profile, very impactful programs like the Regulatory, Regulatory Improvement Code Amendment uh, Project and the DOZA, the Design Overlay Zone Amendment Project, and uh, most recently, the Citywide Anti-Displacement Action Plan. Before coming to Portland in 2008, Catherine served as the research director for the Baton Rouge Area Chamber in post-Katrina, Louisiana, and was a lobbyist at the state legislator advocating for government ethics reform. She's taught classes at Louisiana State University and Syracuse University in conflict resolution and sociology, which I'm just learning about and feels very relevant, um, so glad to know about that. Um, Catherine holds a Master's of Urban Planning and Urban and Regional Planning from Portland State University as well as a master's degree in sociology and a doctorate in conflict resolution from the Maxwell School at Syracuse University. She uh, received her bachelor's degree in psychology from Dartmouth. In her personal time, you can find her with her husband, two kids, and their COVID rescue dog, uh, um, <laughs> wading through streams and rivers, searching for agates or playing volleyball. So welcome, Catherine. We're delighted to have you. Um, also pleased to welcome Joel Devil Court, who has also joined us on the green team within the Development and Investment Department as a new project manager. Most recently, Joel served as the Senior Land Use and Economic Development Advisor for Mayor Sam Licardo in San Jose, California. During the pandemic, his work focused on creating new pathways for struggling small businesses. Prior to that work, Joel worked as an independent land use and strategic planning consultant, including supporting Covia to expand their home sharing program and create affordable solutions for seniors in particular. As a regional director with Greenbelt Alliance, which is a close smart growth ally with um, our own thousand friends here in uh, Oregon, Joel led campaigns to combat the housing crisis, undo systemic inequities, and empower community voices, including sustaining a coalition of established and emerging, emerging community leaders to successfully adopt the City of Oakland's housing impact fee, which was the first major source of affordable housing funding in the area. Joel also earned his Master's of Urban and Regional Planning, but from the University of New Orleans, um, so something in common uh, there, where he fell in love with the city's culture, food, and music, and approach to street life and placemaking. These are things he also loves about Portland, and um, perhaps you recently saw him in gold sequins on the Mardi Gras parade on, on Mississippi, for example, getting right in there. He has um, begun working uh, to update the Gateway Action Plan and will be really focused on our work in East Portland. So Joel, welcome. Thank you. Great, thank you. 
And thank you, uh, Catherine and Joel, for joining us. We're very happy to have you. Great. All right. So uh, next up, we just have approval of the minutes from our March 9, 2022 meeting. Would somebody like to make a motion? Second. Thank you. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Minutes pass unanimously. Okay, so now to our regular agenda. Uh, item six is authorizing the executive director to execute a letter of agreement between Prosper Portland and American, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Council 75, Local 7, excuse me, 3769, to extend the party's collective bargaining agreement by one year. Mr. Chair Cruz, yes. sorry to interrupt. Um, we all need to cover item five, public comment. Ah, uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah, and I think we didn't have any. Is that correct? We do not. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks for the reminder. All right. So I've already read item six, so <laughs> I won't, I won't um, go back through that again. Uh, and um, Hope Whitney and Roger Gonzalez will join us to discuss those items. Welcome. Yeah, we are. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll start. Right. Um, Chair Cruz, nice to see you. Commissioners, Director Good. Branham. Um, so as stated before the board today is consideration of a one-year contract extension via a letter of agreement to the current Prosper Portland Collective Bargaining Agreement um, with the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees Union, AFSCME. I'm here today on behalf of Sean Murray, Prosper Portland's Human Resources Director who is out of the country. Um, so the status of this is that union members by unanimous consent voted last month to ratify this agreement that is today before the board for consideration. Um, our current Collective Bargaining Act, Collective Bargaining Agreement is a three-year agreement that was set to expire on at the end of this fiscal year on June 30th, 2022. Um, however, you know, there's been tremendous change in events of the last few years. You know, Prosper Portland has experienced um, the COVID-19 pandemic, remote work, um, salary reductions at the beginning of this time period. Um, we implemented a vaccine requirement um, there's been numerous vacancies and recruitments that Human Resources has been dealing with. Um, and then just this time of financial uncertainty for Prosper Portland. Um, so instead of devoting resources and engaging in a bargaining to create an entirely new three-year agreement, the parties decided to engage in abbreviated bargaining process um, that would extend the CBA for one year um, just to give everyone sort of space to adjust as to these times and to coming back to the office. Um, so as mentioned, the agreement, which is Exhibit A to the resolution in your packet, it extends the CBA for one year and it keeps all of the terms and provisions of the existing CBA in effect for this one year period. Um, except for the items in the letter agreement that add to or modify this existing CBA. So these are um, allowing for remote work. Um, with manager approval, employees can work up to four weeks entirely remotely out of the office. Um, employees are also permitted to have a hybrid work schedule where they work up to you know, as few as two days in the office with three days at home or somewhere else in the area. Um, Prosper has also committed in this extension with AFSCME as a partner to develop a request for proposal to begin an agency-wide class compensation study by June 1st, 2022. Um, employees will receive a $20 per pay period allowance, hybrid work allowance, which they can use on parking or transit or any other sort of hybrid work costs, you know, maintaining a home office and, a, and commuting. 
Um, also, the extension provides for a 4% cost of living increase. Um, employees will also receive a one-time $5,000 bonus. And you know these provisions are intended to reflect really the extraordinary quality of work that employees have been contributing to Prosper Portland, especially when we've had vacant staff positions. Um, and also to, you know, to encourage retention of existing employees and staff to the extent possible within Prosper's financial constraints. Um, you know, the last thing we want is sort of financial uncertainty and sort of the turmoil with, at this time to start affecting retention and it's just a way to show appreciation to staff. Um, so this action would authorize Kimberly, executive director, to sign the extension agreement. And um, I'll just turn it over to Roger Gonzalez, who is union president for AFSCME Local 75. Thanks, Hope. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Cruz, commissioners, executive director Branham, colleague Justin Douglas, and Pam Feigenbutz. It is good to be in your presence here to say we are good with where we are at. We had... I think a really good solid relationship with our leadership to be able to approach each other and to agree that, you know, we can do this in a way that recognizes the intense labor that we are taking on for our community, for the work that is before us, for who we're serving, and to find a, a path forward on this extension that would buy us that time, essentially. So we reached that, and I'm very thankful uh, for our executive director, for our HR director, Sean who, Murray, who uh, we worked with, uh, Sharon and I. Sharon is right behind me. Sharon Smith is our vice president, current vice president. Um, I also want to thank all the union members, our staff here at this agency, who are on essentially the front lines for our work and are doing the most, I believe, we have the most exceptional public, public servants in our union. They are doing incredible work under exceptional circumstances, as you are as well. And so I'm thankful for your consideration. I'm thankful for the opportunity to serve them in this role. And I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to serve with some of the best folks working in our city. Uh, so with that, happy to answer any questions you may have, but just wanted to say thank you. Thanks very much. And congratulations on reaching this agreement. That's a, a, quite an accomplishment. Would anybody like to ask any questions, or comments, please? I have a question. So about the four weeks, is that four weeks per year, or is that just four weeks at a time, or during certain periods for folks to have off for remote work, um, and why only four weeks? <laughs> um, Commissioner Stoudemire Wesley, that it is four weeks until the end of this extension period. So, so June 30th, 2022. 23. So it's kind of like a hybrid, but a different level of hybrid. So not totally remote work. So they can work remotely only for four weeks during this next year. That's right. Do you want to? Well, so, um, so Roger can, we, we can take this one together, but the, um, but the contract allows for up to, um, to work from home um, up to two days a week, basically, um, in in perpetuity during the time of the contract, and then it allows for four weeks uh, where you would be working from home 100%. Um, and so I think that was where we landed for a couple of reasons. Um, it felt like there was a desire to be able to, um, you know, have times where f folks are working 100% from um, home, given the flexibility that they've had. I think it was also in recognition that as we are learning what it's going to mean to be in hybrid and still understanding community expectations, that if it were much longer than that, you could start to adversely impact your colleagues. Um, so if you need to be at a community meeting, um, we just wanted to under, we, we wanted to, I think, be in a uh, flexible posture, but also to understand that there is an expectation that we are going to be in person at least some portion of the time. Now, right now, we're um, only in the office. The expectation is eight hours a week, so the other four days continue to be hybrid. Um, but that's what's what's uh, articulated within the contract. Okay. And then are the other um, benefits available for all employees or just for AFSCME employees? Yes, correct. 
Okay. They'll be available to all employees. Okay. Thank you. And um, just that that's just a practice that we've had um, historically, particularly to make sure that our non-represented, non-management um, employees also have the same. Right. I was just yeah. making sure that yes. it was equitable exactly. for everyone. Yeah. I have my equity hat on, sorry. Um, no, I'm not sorry, but that's just who I am. Um, so, and I also wanted to make sure that if we're talking about remote work for weeks, that it was for everyone and kind of figuring out. So that's fine, I understand. I'm glad that it's 100%, so thank you. Hey, thank you. Any other comments? Commissioner Myers, can you hear us? Do you have any comments? Okay, he may have dropped off. All right, well, um, would someone like to make a motion to approve resolution number 7447? I make a motion to approve 7447. Thank you. Thank you. All right, those in favor? Aye. All right, okay, passes, thanks very much. Again, yeah. congratulations, that's uh, quite an accomplishment. These things are never easy to negotiate, so that it went along so smoothly is great, so thank you. Thank you. Chair Cruz, can I just express my, my appreciation, um, particularly for Roger and for Sharon, and um, uh, as you mentioned, it's never easy to do these things. It's also not easy to do it remotely um, mm. and to get consensus <laughs> amongst um, you know, a lot of different perspectives all remotely, so um, it's a big lift, and uh, Roger and Sharon you know, are holding, have been holding a lot of this, and they've been great partners, so I want to appreciate both of them, um, as well as Hope and Sean for their leadership in this, so thank you. Great, thank you. Okay. All right, next up we have uh, an information item. This is an update on the Old Town Action Plan, and Bernie Karaski will present on this. Partner in crime is coming up, too. Oh, great. Earl, welcome. <laughs> and Bernie, welcome back. Yeah. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, uh, Chair Cruz, Commissioners, Executive Director Branham, Justin, Hope, and Pam. <laughs> Don't want to leave anybody. Well, again, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity, Carl and I, this opportunity to, to update all of you on, on the fi Old Town Five-Year Action Plan, and also just what has been happening in the neighborhood and, and, and what we see you know, is going to happen in, 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 in future developments. Um, we also just want to recognize we have some guests here, uh, one in particular that will also be coming up to, to give you some um, news. That's Natalia Garcia. Is, works for the Old Town Community Association, has been instrumental in doing just a fantastic job of activating the, neighbor, the neighborhood and getting you know, positive things happen. Also is uh, Jesse Berg and uh, Carrie Som. So Jesse is the president of the Community Association and, and Carrie uh, is an employee for them that has been really doing a fantastic job along with Jesse's help to, to recruit new businesses and get, get, get a lot of these vacancies filled. It's been really, really a, a, a great help you know, to us to, to do that. So anyway, with that, you know, we just want to say, I, I just wanted to say too that you know, despite all the negative things that we hear in the, in, in the media here see, and th there really is a lot of positive things you know, happening here, and hopefully we can demonstrate some of that now too you know, with, 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 the, with the help of our partners. So Justin, you wanna, should I just like do this or, or just, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so thank you. So um, this is our agenda. Next slide, please. So the, the, this is the study area or you know, what the community association focuses on. You, know, you can see it, it's complicated in a sense because we've got two urban renewal areas. We've got downtown waterfront and, we, and, we've, and we've got river district intertwined with each other. So every time we're trying to make a decision, we're trying to figure out, you know, okay, which one is that in? We, we don't have a lot of budget in river district, but we've got more. So that's complex. The other is we have two historic districts. We have the uh, Old Town Skidmore Historic District and we have the um, New Chinatown, Japan, uh, new, excuse me, New Chinatown, Japantown Historic, historic District too. 
And so you can see the boundaries on the north, the Broadway Bridge, uh, the east, the river, the west, the North Park blocks, and the south, mostly uh, Burnside, but then also there's, it, it follows the outline for the um, Skidmore Fountain Histor Historic District. But most of it, you know, the, we've been focusing, the, the southern part has been doing better than the, the, the northern part, so we've been focusing more time and effort, you know, north of Burnside. You know, not at the exclusion of south of Burnside, but that the market it seems to be, be doing a better job there of, of taking that on. Uh, next slide, please. So just a, a little bit about the history. Uh, Old Town has always been an entry point for a lot of diverse immigrant populations, and very notably the, the Chinese population in, in the 1850s um, has been here. And uh, despite a lot of terrible discrimination, they've, they've, they've thrived and done well you know, in the Northwest. The picture up there is a, is, is a um, Chinese New Year parade from the 1930s. I believe that was the, was the time of that parade. Slide, please. Okay. Also, along with the Chinese, the Japanese have been right there, too. And the, 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 it was more in the 1890s the Japanese were here. Um, they also were thriving here in, in, in Old Town. Unfortunately, you know, they had a terrible act of the, the internment during World War II from 1942 to 1945. Um, that they had to that they had to endure. Okay, the picture there is the Japanese American School on Fifth and Flanders, and it, right now I think there's a design company there. That's not too far from our old offices. And what's a little bit kind of neat about that is right around the corner from that on on Flanders and Fourth is uh, the Japanese American Museum of, of Oregon. And uh, Commissioner, I think you toured that. Yes, that was wonderful. That was when they they first they first opened up, and it, it just depicts what happened with this internment, and it's a very sad but but um, you know a learning event there. And so they, with with our help of of selling them that condominium plus a lot of money that they raised from the community, you know, made that happen. And I know they want to have another tour for staff soon. You know, when they uh, when things start to settle down a little bit. Okay, next slide, please. And then also, um, black Portlanders also have a rich history in, in, in Old Town. The Golden West Hotel was the first hotel to break down racist barriers and accept uh, blacks as patrons. And it was also it served as kind of a, um, a, a cultural hub, you know, and, and, and there was a lot of black entrepreneurs that had businesses in there. And so, you know, as you know, it's still, it's still in business over on uh, Everett and Broadway. Next slide, please. Okay, past investment in Old Town. So these are all pretty major investments, but they all happened before the action plan was initiated in 2014. This was a lot of focusing on, on institutions, you know, um, uh, educational institutions. So in the first upper right-hand corner, you see the Lansu Chinese Gardens. I think that was 1998 that went in, and we've been supporting that through the years. Uh, right below that, uh, middle right, uh, that's OCOM, the or Oregon College of Oriental Medicine, their, their shop um, in their the commissary there. Uh, they entered, they came in in uh, 2012, and I remember that because I, I was a loan underwriter for that project, and it was one of our first new market tax credit projects and that helped uh, make that one, that one go. And then below in the right-hand corner is Mercy Corps that uh, opened in 2009 by the Skidmore Fountain. And, and I don't want to also forget the, uh, the permanent home for the Portland Saturday market up there in the left-hand corner at, at 2009. So these are all things that happened before we even, we even had an action plan. There was, there was still a lot going on. So Justin, next slide, please. Okay. Okay, so then that, that now we get into the action plan and, you know, why, why did we even have this? Um, so from my understanding is, is that it was, we wanted to have a little bit better coordination between a lot of different bureaus, between us, between the community, and focus on really what was most important, you know, here in Old Town. What actually needed 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 to happen, um, and then why was it extended? Well, we got to the end of the line, and there was still a lot. There was a lot done, but there was still a lot lot more work to do, and there was budget, you know, there too. So, we, it, it's been extended for another five years until twenty three twenty four. Okay, next please. The priorities, you know, to kind of boil it down into a nutshell, three basic priorities or categories, neighborhood investment, traditionally, basically traditional real estate development, both, both public and private, 
um, you know, there was a lot of vacant lots. There's a lot of land, and excuse me, or even partially developed sites that just need a lot of work and a lot of investment to focus on that. Then also business vitality, really more just helping, doing a lot to help the small businesses that make, make this neighborhood thrive and be able to stay here with loans and grants. And then finally, district livability, which would encompass infrastructure projects and help with uh, cultural institutions and, and, and nonprofits. So those three. So, oh, and the picture is, oh, go back, I'm sorry. The picture, so you can see, that's the, the Chinatown Gate. We're looking down, down Fourth Avenue, and just so you know that Prosper Portland has supported that with several hundred thousand dollars of grants for repairs and, and has another one on the docket. To, we have an agreement with PBOT to, and the Community Association to, to do renovations, but for the, we're waiting for, because of COVID, the tiles, we can't get the tiles. So it's unfortunate you can't go down to Home Depot and buy these tiles. They have to specially made these in China, and it's actually in a certain place in China, and so that's been, been the hold up there. But that, that's, uh, we want to make sure that that's preserved. Okay, uh, next. Okay, so here um, is just a, a, a kind of boiling the, the whole budget down. So Prosper Portland made a really significant investment or pledge in 2014 to invest $57 million in this district, which is, a, is you know, of course, a great, great deal of money. And that's split between the two different urban renewal areas. So in the first seven years of the action plan, it's been about 18 million is spent. So that's only a third. So there's still there's still two thirds of this 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 budget you know, remaining. And you know we're wondering, well is this going to happen in two or three years? Well I mean the most important thing is we want to make sure the money's well spent and it's a it's a good investment. It's not just about spending but spending it wisely. But we do have and, and Carl's going to get into this a little bit more is there's three or four, I think we're gonna be fairly significant real estate projects. We have the, the lot next to the gate, fourth and Burnside. We have block 24 and 25 over here by the, by the uh, Lansu Gardens that could, could require a significant investment. So that a lot of that money could, ha could go into those projects in the future. Um, yes, no, next slide please. And so this is uh, some neighborhood investments that have happened you know, larger investments that have happened uh, with the action plan. You can see up in the upper right-hand corner um, is the Anchor Moisson uh, development really close by with Girding Eadlin. Below that is the Overland Hotel um, project that was very closer on the same block as, as our old office. And for years and years it was, we, you know, we, we are the development commission, but we had, I think it was a really was in a very attractive building, and finally this happened, and uh, that was a, that was a very good thing. And then on the left side, upper left, is the um, lobby and coffee shop for the Society Hotel, which of course Jesse is the uh, is the owner, and uh, that was a significant project back in 1415. And then we also had the uh, request for proposals awarded for Block 25 and for Fourth and Burnside, and there was an acquisition done on Block 24. Uh, it was acquired from Northwest Natural in partnership. Well, we, we acquired it, but it's, we, we did, we're doing this in partnership with Land Sioux they, for, for a cultural center and an event center there, and also a mixed-use development. <clears throat> okay, next slide, please. Um, grants have also been big for the small, but for the, the small businesses. Grants, uh, we have the Prosperity Improvement, or excuse me, Prosperity Investment Program grant that has been really, really helpful. Uh, a lot, the community livability grant and also repair grants over the last three years, it, uh, we've invested over $800,000 in, in the neighborhood in those grants. And you can see that picture is of the Merchant Hotel just, just down the street here. And um, Carrie has been real, and, and Jesse have been really, really busy trying to get that activated and, and tenants in there, and they've done a great job of that. And it's also helped using that tool of the, uh, the PIP grant or the Prosperity Investment Program grant to help entrepreneurs with, with, their, with their tenant improvements in, in, that, in that space. Next slide, please. This where you take over. You want me to do this? One more. Okay, you want me to call? <laughs> okay. Yeah, we got one other one. I'm going to hand the baton off here, so we're not quite sure. Okay, so cultural institutions. So, um, they're big here, you know. We, that, that's part of this neighborhood too. Is 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 we we have 
the Japanese American Museum, we have the, the Chinatown Museum, and we have Lansu Chinese Gardens. And so over the past few years, we've invested 11.4 million you know, in, in these institutions. You know, so, so the Portland, the Chinatown Museum, it was a $2.3 million loan to help them acquire that property instead of just lease it and really secure their, their space here, which they are going to invest additional mon uh, money in that property and put a second floor on that and improve the facade on, along 3rd Avenue um, to, to get back to historic standards. And as I mentioned, the Japanese American Museum of Oregon, that was a, uh, of Oregon, that was a $1 million grant, not, excuse me, not grant, $1 million loan to help them acquire that space. And then finally, the Lansu Chinese Gardens, there's been several hundred thousand dollars of repairs that we've invested in that. And then also us purchasing Block 24 for $8 million to eventually build a mixed-use development there that will include, um, uh, hopefully, you know, a, a event center and a cultural center for the, for the, um, the gardens, so. Next one, please, okay. One me, okay, all right, Na neighborhood livability. So here's where we get into the fourth and Burnside. So we have a, a, a memorandum of understanding with Colas Construction for the 35,000 square foot mixed use development there right next to the gate. And they are starting with some pre-development work this spring. You know, that project's been kind of held back because of what happened with COVID. It, real estate really just kind of ground to a halt there for a while. And as I mentioned before, our help with the, with the Chinatown gate restoration, we have 300,000 that we're contributing uh, to uh, PBOT to help that happen. Also, which is a, an important project for the neighborhood, uh, there's the railroad quiet zone that we've got 200,000 in the budget for. Um, I don't know if anybody, you've probably been stuck down here by a train, you hear the, <laughs> the noise, where well, the neighbors are, oh, they want something that's quiet, like, like in the Pearl District. So, you know, this is just fair to this neighborhood too. So we put 200,000 in the budget. Most of that's gonna come from the railroad. That, that 200 just gonna close a gap for the most part. And then also we have the disposition of the old fire fire station property that is, is going on right now. Um, where we, We've got some talks with a, a current buyer. They don't want us to reveal that publicly who they are, but that'll come out soon. And we also have a potential a broker that we can hire if that sale doesn't go through to the other, to the other buyer. So. Okay, all right. Oh, I think that's me. Chair Cruz, commissioners, thank you. Um, so I think what I want to, to start with was a, a thank you, of course, and I have lots of thank yous, uh, but thank you to Bernie Karofsky. Uh, Bernie has been uh, an amazing uh, support project manager, steadfast, uh, what other words could I use? Uh, he's been just fantastic in terms of, you've seen some of the work that, um, you know, it's on the screen, you've seen some of the work he's been working on. I think what's really, for me, uh, has been a uh, to be able to rely on him and for him and his partnership, frankly, with the community. And I think uh, some of the community is here today. I, I know that they have said they have lots of um, uh, gratitude for Bernie's work, and so do I. So I want to just say thank you, Bernie, for, for all that you have done to make this, uh, to, to do work in, in Old Town and all that you continue to do. So... Um, what I wanted to talk about was, was um, something that I think we can't ignore, which is uh, obviously things have been uh, a little challenging here in, in Old Town. Uh, so I don't want to uh, pretend that that's not, that doesn't happen or it's not happened. Um, I think from our perspective, we saw this as um, obviously a huge challenge, but also an opportunity uh, for the city's economic development agency to, to get involved. And so um, we did what we can, and we have done what we could as the city's economic development agency. I think we've gone over and above that, and I think um, what I want to talk a little bit about today was some of the, not only what you would expect us to do, but some of the things you might not expect us to do. So uh, obviously COVID, February-ish of 2020, um, February, March, uh, things got um, more challenging here in, in Old Town. Uh, we had a, a response as an agency uh, that was not, um, uh, I would say that, that we had this, we had a response as well in, in Old Town. So the first thing that, one of the first things we did was uh, we had support for businesses and nonprofits 
through a uh, small business relief fund, uh, which was really a citywide, a citywide program, uh, as well as our repair grants. Uh, and so I don't have the stats uh, for the small business relief fund. Uh, the program overall was, was um, $15 million, roughly um, $10,000 per business. And there's, if you look at our, look at our website and see the spots on the, on the website uh, where those grants happened, uh, many, many, many of them are here. Um, I also note that the repair grants we had uh, 35, I believe, is the number altogether uh, for totaling $140,000, so about $4,000 per business. Um, so helping 35 businesses um, to repair just kind of stuff that went wrong during the during uh, COVID and the kind of pandemic. Um, one thing that we uh, we did is we asked Eco Northwest, who's a contractor on our uh, flexible services list, um, to help us with uh, kind of directly addressing the uh, the crisis. And so they put together this activation and stimulus strategy that you see here. It follows very closely as Bernie outlined. It follows very closely. Um, what's in the five-year action plan. It has a set of recommendations, which again are close to the action plan, but um, really uh, mirror that, but, but dig much more deeply into that and a really kind of um, crisis, again, crisis sort of intervention or, or uh, pandemic intervention. So the three, t three topics are uh, visibility, connectivity, safety and cleanliness, business growth and development, and then improvements to existing spaces. Um, the last thing I want to say on this slide is about our partnership with Old Town Community Association. Um, we'll talk some more about that, and I'll have uh, folks from Old Town Community Association come up and, and speak. But what I wanted to say was that um, we had invested in the OTCA uh, in previous years, but uh, as through the, um, the pandemic, uh, we thought that it was super important to support the people who are actually here on the ground doing the work every day. Um, so Bernie is certainly here, uh, but the folks who live and work here uh, and are connected to OTCA have some kind of a special relationship with the, with the district. Um, so we increased our funding very significantly in the last year. Uh, we, fund, we have funded uh, positions both as the business navigator, uh, who Carrie Sam is in that position now, and uh, the events coordinator, uh, which Natalia Garcia, who you'll hear from shortly, as in that position. So um, it was not just the partnership and the kind of working together, but it was also making that staff, frankly, helping that, helping them to uh, have staff to, to do that kind of work. Go ahead, Peter. Just a quick question. Um, when was the Eco Northwest study done? That was May 2021 was when May it was finished. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so we launched right into it. Um, and then it took roughly two months-ish to, to go through. All right, next slide, Just. So um, I mentioned that I want to say thank you, um, and my computer shut off because I'm going to have to um, read this piece of my. Um, so I'm not going. I'm not going to memorize this. So um, some thank yous. Uh, so. As an economic development agency, we work on property. We have tax increment financing. Uh, it's a very sort of, as you well know, sticks and bricks kind of approach. But we thought that we knew that working in Old Town, that we couldn't just have that approach. That wouldn't be sufficient. Uh, we recognize that safety and cleanliness was sort of, I don't know, kind of the, you had to have that in order to have anything else. And the community association uh, let us know that. So um, we are very fortunate to have Burke Nelson on staff. Uh, my, I'm going to read, read this part because uh, I'm not going to remember exactly what it was. But uh, so uh, Burke I th will be awarded the Francis King Clancy Trophy. Now, I am not a uh, big hockey fan, but uh, obviously Burke is. And apparently the uh, Clancy Trophy is awarded to the player who, quote, best exemplifies leadership qualities on and off the ice and has made a noteworthy humanitarian contribution to his community. So substitute Old Town for ICE, and that would be definitely Burke. Uh, so Burke has come in and really, uh, one of the things I think we don't appreciate so much as, as an economic development agency is that not just the sort of sticks and bricks investment that we do, but really the coordination role, bringing folks together and solving problems and really kind of having the big picture. And so Burke has really done that in this area of sort of safety and cleanliness and has coordinated with the impact reduction program, with Clean and Safe, with the police, with the mayor's office, and that's been really invaluable. And I know that the Old Town Community Association and the folks that live in, and work here are really appreciative of his work, and so am I. It's been very crucial to, to making, this, making this happen. So next slide. Um, 
so here on this slide, I want to talk a little bit about Carrie's work. Um, so all there's a businesses of 10-ish businesses on this slide. Carrie has either recruited or uh, helped retain all of these businesses. And I think, Carrie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, all of these businesses are either BIPOC owned or BIPOC operated. Uh, in the upper, le upper left hand corner is a picture from uh, Mimi's Fresh Teas. Uh, the Red Robe uh, Tea House is slated to open. Uh, Black Star Athletic Academy is coming. And then in the lower left, um, sort of near and dear to my heart, uh, is uh, Wally Agbula and uh, Cyrus Coleman, who are the owners of um, what they're calling Creative Homies, which is a, a, a new endeavor that uh, they purchased the building at the corner of 4th and Gleason, the enterprise uh, building that they'll have a very cool sort of BIPOC focused arts, uh, creative space, it's got production, gallery, uh, bar, um, and uh, I think uh, maybe an after hour speakeasy even. Um, so this is all, again, our partnership with the Old Town Community Association and particularly with Carrie to, to, bring, uh, to bring these businesses to town. And uh, I, I guess this is a little bit of a lead into uh, what I want you to get an idea about is like what's happening here in Old Town now. And so they'll talk some more about that in a minute. Next slide. Uh, so part of the strategy was not just to do um, sort of safety and kind of the business recruitment, but also to get people down here. Uh, and so we have spent, uh, you know, the better part of a year working on events and activations. This is a really great thing. It's not permanent space, uh, but people come to come to the area, and there's sort of an opportunity for uh, to let, let people know we're here, uh, but also to sort of celebrate the area and to, um, to to sort of promote the brand, if you will. So a number of events here. Um, the basketball pictures from the March Madness celebration that just happened, the block party on the holiday market. You can see that, um, that Natalia uh, was the lead for, uh, and she's going to tell you about some additional stuff that she's working on. So I want to introduce, um, I'll, we'll take some questions, but I do want to introduce Natalia Garcia. Um, I'm really excited to have her here. Uh, she's the events coordinator for OTCA. I think uh, you'll just hear from her what she's up to, certainly, she'll tell you that. But I think it also sort of um, her presence sort of as, um, I don't know, recognizes kind of the energy that uh, I think is is kind of taking shape here in Old Town. So I want to appreciate that, you know, this is not just a, you know, a bunch of buildings or kind of a, you know, a, a history, but also that it's a kind of a, a live, a living place and that there's a lot of really cool stuff happening here. So I know, uh, you know, the media has had a lot of sort of negative things to say about Old Town, but I think there's a lot of really, really good stuff here, some of which we've touched on and some of which our folks, from, our friends from OTCA can, can tell you about. So I think with that, either we'll take questions or we'll bring Natalia up. Questions? No? So quick, a few quick questions. Um, I know in my conversations with Jesse Carey, um, and I got a nice walking tour of the, of the old town space, um, what's become clear and, and, and sort of is already happening de facto is that the, you know, this, this district, which historically in old Portland was the place where everybody who was kind of othered ended up, right? right? Um, in some ways, uh, I think is going to be um, potentially a, a sort of a, a place where a renaissance occurs for for, for BIPOC owned small businesses, right? Yep. So, um, and yet, um, I don't know to what degree um, that has been explicitly stated, right? As sort of like the strategy. So that's right. Mean, right. That's so I'm right. wondering to, to what degree that has been discussed internally, you yep. know, at Prosper. And, yeah. And, I, I, think I, see it, I see it as a strategic opportunity given the 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 continuing pivot we're making in our own, you know, um, economic development framework, so. Yeah, I think we're really in the middle of it. Um, and uh, it has not, you know, Bernie's introduction is certainly, I think, educational about where, where this district has been. And I think, you know, in this challenge, there's also opportunity, obviously, it's a, you know, cliche, but it's really true. Uh, and I, I really feel like what has, what is possible here um, comes from maybe it's a it's a model that uh, is perhaps common in other cities throughout the country, uh, where places that have been downtrodden a bit uh, then become places that are um, transformed by uh, bringing creative energy, bringing people of color, people with different ideas, uh, and not sort of the sort of same old same old. So I feel like we're not 
we're not there as a, hasn't totally landed yet. Maybe the five, next five year action plan will be more explicit about that. Um, but we are certainly uh, turning that corner. I really see that as the vision. And I think that's the vision of the OTCA and you'll hear from, from them uh, as they come up and, and talk about that. Um, just one quick yeah, question or comment. Um, you know, it seems like we're doing great work down here, and I'm really impressed with everything you guys have all done. I mean, it's really quite, um, you know, amazing what you've done, really, given all the constraints and given all the problems that we've had, you know, as a city and as a society over the last couple of years. It's pretty, pretty impressive. Have we um, been successful in coordinating with other bureaus, city bureaus and agencies, in dealing with like the livability issues and whatnot, because those are a little bit outside of yep. our, um, you know, our our parameters. And I assume that other folks within the city are addressing those things at the same time. And I just kind of wonder about the coordination there. Could you speak to that? Yep. Um, so I, actually, I might ask Burke to to uh, to address that a little bit. Um, you know, he's been really a point person. Uh, I think he's here. Yep. Uh, he's been really a point person uh, working with a number of programs, including the police, uh, with Clean and Safe, uh, with the Impact Reduction Program. Um, and that's, it's like I said earlier, it's really a unique role, uh, I don't know, unique. It's a rare role for Prosper to get that deeply involved in those kinds of issues, not in terms of coordination. We do cross bureau coordination all the time, um, but to do this sort of cross bureau coordination in this specific realm. So I don't know, Burke, do you want to say a few things? It just seems like there's a lot of overlap. <laughs> so uh, it's great. Thank well, you. It's real quick. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Good to see everyone uh, again. And good to see everyone in person <laughs> again. Um, yeah, in, in regards to the coordination, uh, I actually used a lot of the relationships I developed in the mayor's office um, and asked for, um, as we said, coordination, trying to break down the silos between, that exist between the different bureaus. And because of the relationships I had, everybody was eager to try and address the concerns that do exist within Old Town um, uh, currently. And what COVID provided was a unique perspective for everybody to take a breath and actually observe what these issues were, right? And so um, I was just talking with uh, my supervisor, Amy Nagy, about, uh, you know, just in regards to trash, where we have so many different entities that are responsible for addressing. So we've got BPS, we've got Clean and Safe, which is private. We've got ERP, the Impact Reduction Program, uh, which is joint between city and county. Uh, and then we've also got to uh, engage the Portland Police Bureau to address um, some of the, the, the tent camping that exists. So um, I uh, was able to develop a weekly meeting um, to bring everybody together around specific um, events. So the first one was the um, uh, MLS championship match uh, that took place in Portland, uh, which that required all hands on deck uh, to get make it comfortable for people coming outside of town, outside of the city, outside of the state, uh, to feel comfortable coming into Portland. And then use those same entities and replicated that for the March Madness event that just took place um, last month. And then um, what we've got upcoming, we're going to use uh, all these same um, uh, players for the World Athletics Championships that's going to be taking place in Eugene. But we know that there'll be a lot of travelers coming in through Portland uh, on their way to Eugene. And that will be uh, for weeks long. And I know that uh, Natalia and Carrie and Jesse will also speak about the conversations we had in preparation for that event. So um, the biggest thing is breaking down the silos, uh, which we were able to do um, to great success. And we're going to use that same formula uh, going forward for the rest of the year. And hopefully we can replicate that in other areas around the city. Great, thank you. Yeah, congratulations. Excuse me. Congratulations on your award too. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know. I was thinking. <laughs> thank you, everyone. I, I, to that point, I'm wondering. This is a question, um, Kimberly, more for you. Um, but um, as as you know, the governance structure changes, and um, at City Hall, I'm wondering if this is an opportunity to articulate as part of our economic development framework the, just the importance of public safety, right? Because it usually falls outside, right? This kind of 
over here, and then there's some handoff occurs at some point, right, where the where ECDEV takes over. But I think obviously the, the Burke spoke to the the crisis of the last two years has has made that um, distinction a little less, a little more fuzzy, right, and that boundary a little bit more fuzzy. So I'm wondering if that's something we could do again internally, um, because I know it's on every every business person, particularly small businesses, uh, it's on their mind. Yeah, it's just they're dealing with it every day. Absolutely. I, you know, Commissioner, I think we um, were just having a conversation around the inclusive economic development strategy and sort of what are the priorities, what are the tools, and how do we talk about those points um, of intersection and co where there's really, you know, if we're not successful around public safety, we cannot be competitive economically. Um, it's definitely not Prosper Portland's agenda or toolkit kit to set, um, but I do think we have a important voice um, to share, to express how instrumental that will be in terms of our recovery, um, and particularly in neighborhoods in which we have such a deep investment, like Old Town, um, you know, I think we can be advocates and can play this sort of role of connecting folks. Um, I think one of the key takeaways that um, comes up for me in this and something we're advocating for in the budget process or have put forward is just the importance of having capacity on the ground that can be responsive to um, the specific neighborhood priorities that really has a tie to business. So whether that's in Old Town or whether that's in the Rosewood um, or at Jade District or Division Midway, you know, having people who are full-time on the ground, not volunteers, who can actually be looking at how do you um, identify what the assets of a place are, identify the key challenges, and then be that kind of um, full-time interface between public side and the private side and the community side is so important. We've seen that with the Neighborhood Prosperity Initiative districts, but I think that's really bearing out in Old Town as well. So I feel like that's one of those areas that we can probably, um, you know, within economic development, and community development really advocate for resourcing folks who are on the ground who can support, um, whether that's around advocating for clean uh, cleanup or public safety or um, for retenanting. So that that would be a priority. I think my guess is that that will be expressed as a priority. Just one more question on on that note. I'd taken some notes from um, my walk walking tour uh, prior, and one of the things I noted, I think that Jesse brought up, was just the lack of of um, functional street lighting, right? And that's something that creates, you know, dark zones, up, you know, they're essentially areas that are harder to police, so to speak, right? So again, that to me speaks to some, again, some of this fuzzy boundaries about where public safety overlaps in terms of actions or where there are interventions that would fall in our domain and would say, no, we just, let's get these lights fixed. <laughs> let's get more street lights put up, right? Um, that doesn't, that's not in the police bureaus, you know, uh, jurisdiction. And so I think those are the kinds of conditions, sort of, you know, public safety conditions that we can control or at least have some say over that are preconditions for a basic kind of, you know, environment in which is, you know, helpful and supportive of small business. Yeah, absolutely. I know we have been looking at the light issue. Um, I don't know that light bulbs are TIF eligible. I don't believe that they are, but I, um, <laughs> but I, but I do think. But I think your your broader point is really important, which is how do we, you know, if if you think about community development as sort of stone soup or ecosystem, right? What can we each bring to bear, knowing that um, we need to be coordinated and that we need to be leaning in in those places. I think we definitely are looking at how we can be creative with the resources that we have, whether those are personal, personal resources, personnel resources, excuse me, or financial resources. Great, thanks very much. Yeah, I'd Appreciate love that. to have Natalia Garcia come up and uh, do a little uh, intro to what she's been working on. Great, welcome. Great. Hello. <clears throat> okay, first time on a mic in a while. Uh, nice to meet you guys. I'm Natalia. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on who I am, um, I am a person of color. I'm Mexicana. I'm a small business owner. That's how I got associated with the OTCA. Um, I participate in a lot of community um, events and activities outside of Old Town, um, and that's kind of how I, you know, started doing work with the Old Town Community Association. So. That's where I'm coming from. Um, thank you guys for taking the time to listen and thank you guys for supporting us thus far. Um, I'm very much so part of the community and so this means a lot to me. 
Um, so past and future event updates that have been going on in Old Town since I've started. Um, first of all, I just want to point out our website is kind of a work in process, but it's a lot more updated as of right now. So if you want to take a look at some of the things that have been going on, we have great uh, photo galleries that show you, um, you know, full blown what's been going on, who's participating in these events, um, what does the turnout look like, um, and what does just the overall community uh, want and need from us. Um, so those are all linked there and be sure to, you know, take a peek at that whenever you get a chance. Okay, so one of the things that I have started doing since I started working with the OTCA is um, remembering who our community here in Old Town is. And so when I became the events coordinator, it was really important to me to um, make sure that we didn't forget about the houseless community here. You know, let's be realistic. Let's see what's really going on. Um, like I said, I participate in a lot of community events. I'm a vintage vendor, so I have a lot of vendor friends. And I said, we have a lot of clothes, and there's a lot of facilities and shelters around here that need us. Um, so I uh, came up with this concept as a free clothing pop-up. So, you know, I gather a few vendor friends. We set up just like we would any other flea market. We go out, we take stuff, it's completely free. Um, a lot of these places already have uh, clothing closets um, for their members, but this is a whole different experience. We actually get to interact with people. Uh, it definitely does spark joy, and it just changes the overall attitude um, between, um, you know, business owners, people who work here, um, and people who are living on the streets. So, uh, yeah. This is very, very meaningful work, and this is not something that you know we're you know getting funding for or anything like that. But I just think it's important to point out that we are also doing work like this um, alongside some of the other larger events that we're throwing. Okay, so um, as they've mentioned, we threw a big block party for March Madness. Um, saw around 200, 250 guests. Um, this is one of the biggest events that we've thrown um, since COVID. Uh, so, you know, work in progress. Um, but we did have streetwear vendors out there. We had some a food vendor, beer garden, and then we partnered with Black Star Athletic Academy, who we mentioned earlier, um, to coordinate a three-on-three -three basketball tournament with their youth athletes. So that brought out a lot of families, and it was just overall a really wonderful day. We had a lot of walk-through traffic, people who were staying at the hotels or just walking around town and were like stumbled upon the event and were like, what's going on here? Um, so that was really awesome. And it was a clean and seamless event, which I want to point out. Being on Davis, you know, that's kind of like the zone of a lot of action that goes down here in Old Town. And one thing I made note of is we were taking up that whole block. All of us were having fun. There was music. There was food. And there was no weird stuff that happened. You know, there was houseless people out there that were dancing to the music, watching the basketball tournament, and it was joyful. Um, and we didn't we didn't have any issues, so um, that was awesome to see. Uh, these are just some photos. Like I said, you can click on the link and you can look at the photo galleries of all the past events we've had, some of the vendors, um, Black Star, um, and then we had some local businesses that we put together goodie bags for um, for the winners of the tournament. Uh, this was another really awesome event that happened at the end of March. Um, it's called the Chinatown Meet, and this is um, some really well-known streetwear vendors, um, actual brick-and-mortar stores that came and did like a special event uh, sale. Um, we had a line outside the door. We had food vendors outside that everybody was super excited about. There was, like I said, there was like a line outside the door the entire time. Um, you know, art, streetwear, sneakers, food everything that Old Town represents right now. That is the community that is going to continue to take up space here. Um, like somebody mentioned earlier, it's the place that a lot of people who've been othered come to, and I think that's why this has kind of been like the start of what you mentioned, uh, which I think will be like a whole kind of art, streetwear revolution in the middle of Old Town. Uh, again, more photos. It was packed in there, as you can see. Um, amazing, amazing members of the community came out to support each other. 
Um, so this is what's currently going on. So we do have a community gallery space on 4th Avenue. So that's part of what I've been doing is coordinating, rotating art shows monthly in that space. Um, that's also where we're holding these community events. So that's where the Chinatown meet was. Um, right now, it's the Latinx art show. It's called Nuestros Antepasados. Um, this is an anniversary show that we hosted um, in this space last year when I was not working for OTCA, but I curated the show. Um, so last year was super, super successful. We had such a great outpour support from the community and everybody wanted to know when the next event was and where they could find us again. So when I started working with the OTCA, I said, we're doing an anniversary show and we're doing it even bigger this time. So that's currently on exhibit. Um, this weekend is the closing weekend. This Saturday is the closing street festival. Um, so it'll be gallery and we'll also have uh, street vendors out there, and a marketplace, we're gonna have a car show, uh, music performers, food. Um, it should be a really, really great experience. So if any of you guys are free, be sure to drop by. It'll be on uh, Northwest 4th and Davis. Um, we've sold a lot of artwork. Um, I'm thinking at the end of this week when we'll be pretty close to sold out. And so, you know, that's an amazing opportunity for the artists who are participating. Uh, we're putting money back into you know, by POC pockets, um, and we're really supporting the art community here in Old Town. Uh, so like I said, that's this Saturday, Closing Day Street Festival, uh, really excited. Traditional song and dance, local bands, we'll have a drag performance, a car show, DJ Collective, really elevating the experience. Um, and this is what's coming up in the next few months. Um, so really exciting outlook for the next few months going into the summertime. Uh, we have the art exhibitions in the Tuck Lung Gallery space that I mentioned. So uh, May will be split up into two different shows. We have the Chinese um, Artist Coalition that will be doing a show from May 7th to the 14th. Opening day will also be the Dragon Parade that Portland Chinatown Museum is putting on. Uh, May 14th, we have an uh, Organ Rises Above Hate event um, that is put on by Land Sioux Gardens and AAPI. Um, they're going to be closing down Northwest Davis and Northwest Flanders Festival Streets for those, for that event. Um, May 21st through June 4th, a solo show by a local community member, Alicia Pinkley. She's a, um, a designer for Jordan, amazing artist. She does clay work, painting. Um, so she'll have that slot. And then um, we are also uh, working with the Rose Festival this year. Uh, they actually reached out to me and Carrie to help them uh, fill their marketplace. So we're the ones who are helping them source vendors for their marketplace. Um, Carrie has also helped them find uh, entertainment for their stages. Um, and so that'll be happening. We're going to um, coordinate a few events um, on the dates of the Starlight Parade to kind of bring people down into Old Town from the Rose Festival. So lots of fun stuff um, in the works there. And then uh, June 18th, we're working with uh, another local community member, Cole Reed. Um, she is curating an art show in the gallery, and we are also going to be having a big runway show and street festival. Runway show highlighting um, some really talented black uh, fashion designers in, uh, in Portland. So really looking forward to that. Um, and I think that will also be a great... Um, start to what I said was like what's going to be an amazing summer I think here in Old Town that'll definitely trickle into um, fall thank you great. thanks very much <laughs> That's exciting yeah a lot of great events I'll try to come this weekend That's what, that's what we have. I think uh, we also have a tour a week from today, a walking tour, which I hope you will all be able to make. Uh, I think Jesse and Carrie will lead you, so you'll see uh, some additional things that we weren't able to talk about today uh, and hopefully get to experience some of the businesses that are actually physically here in Old Town. So hopefully uh, we'll see you then. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Thanks Thank for coming you. today. And I do have some flyers for this weekend, so I'll leave them around for you guys. <laughs> okay. All right. So next up, we have uh, item number eight, and that's an update on the fiscal year 2022-23 20, budget development process. 
and Tony Barnes will present on that. So welcome, Tony. Well, good afternoon, Chair Cruz and Commissioners. Um, Kimberly, Branham, Pam, Justin, and Hope. It's really good to see you. Very good to see you today, this afternoon. Um, I'll be presenting an um, update on the current year, uh, actually the FY22. 23 budget process, where we've been over the last few months, um, what's transpired since we last presented uh, the draft budget with you in uh, January during the budget work session, and some next steps in the process. Our next slide, please. So this, this um, timeline shows uh, where we've been over the last few months and, and where we're headed. Um, since November, we've been uh, diligently working on the budget, drafting the budget, working with our community budget committee on the draft budget. We had our board retreat in December that outlined work plans and priorities, and then our budget work session um, in January. Um, since then, there's been a series of council work sessions on the budget, looking at uh, council priorities and themes as well as uh, additional stakeholder review within the communities, uh, mainly around TIF districts. Uh, next steps in the process, uh, we anticipate the mayor to release his proposed budget uh, next week, April 28th, with those budget decisions. Um, we'll include those budget proposals in the Prosper Portland proposed budget, and then um, present that to council on May 4th. Uh, council will take action on the budget on May 18th, uh, and then Finally, it will be back to the board for final action on June 7th, along with the Tax Supervising and Conservation Commission hearing. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, in March, in February and March, there was a series of uh, additional stakeholder um, uh, review sessions going out to the community, different TIF districts, um, uh, staff reviewed the budgets with uh, the Old Town Community Association, South Portland. Um, Neighborhood Association, Gateway Area Business Association, Hazelwood Neighborhood Association, Gold Lloyd, uh, Central East Side Industrial Council, and the North Northeast Community Development Initiative. Slide, please. Uh, some summary uh, of the input from the uh, budget uh, output is included in, I think it's attachment A to the report. Um, it includes um, uh, recommendations and uh, review input from the community. Uh, in general, the uh, comments were largely aligned with uh, the requested budgets for the TIF districts uh, in Old Town, Chinatown, um, sorry, Old Town, River District, Downtown Waterfront. Um, much of what was presented today aligns with the budget, um, along with infrastructure and business navigator events and um, activities over the next fiscal year. In North McAdam, um, infrastructure, completing Southwest Bond, improving the South Portal, um, Greenway improvements. Uh, in the Gateway District, uh, continuing the Gateway Action Plan, uh, focusing on the halsey Widler corridor, uh, redeveloping, like, re redeveloping large vacant properties, and continuing the, um, the build out of affordable commercial space at the Nick Fish. Next slide, please. New York and Convention Center, um, renovating the Inet Convention Center, uh, using additional resources for uh, improving and activating the 910 Action Sports Building, and uh, partnering with uh, a focus on growing the BIPOC owner presence within the district. And in the Central East Side District, uh, supporting uh, investments in the workshop blocks, the OMSI campus, partnering in activation with the workshop blocks, and under the Morrison Bridge, and continuing funding repair grants in the district. And next slide, please. In North Northeast, um, <clears throat> support for potential acquisition property at Northeast 15th and Killingsworth, uh, partnering with the Housing Bureau to promote preference policy for the black households in the community, and further opportunities to promote uh, Prosper Portland financial products, services, programs to help uh, BIPOC businesses. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Turn this on, huh? <laughs> Um, when it, the um, preference policy, can you speak a little bit more on that? Partnering with the, yes. the Portland Housing Bureau. Um, I think we have Amy Nagy with us today. Right. I think or, Lisa Abwaf can Lisa. speak probably to the conversation. Oh. Yeah. 
Good afternoon, Commissioner. The preference policy is a policy that the Housing Bureau uses for their affordable housing dollars set aside, and then we actually have a contribution that comes in because their programs end for folks making, actually these particular programs end for folks who are making 80% median family income or below. We've expanded it acknowledging how expensive home ownership opportunities can be in North Northeast. We actually contribute additional dollars over to the Housing Bureau tied to home repair and home ownership. It goes from 80% median family income to 120% median family income and the preference policy it's a way they actually provide points if you can show that you or your family are were displaced out of North Northeast. And then there are additional points if your family was impacted by, um, by urban renewal in the okay. past. One more question. Yeah. Um, it goes back to the Oregon Convention Center. Yeah. So just a little bit more on the um, supporting the, um, the one, selling 100 Multnomah air, air rights. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit on that one too as well? Sure. So... Um, the 100 Multnomah, I'll start with the basic. The 100 Multnomah is the parking garage that okay. we built together with the um, the convention center hotel. So it's actually the garage that serves the hotel because without it, the, um, you couldn't park the hotel. There are air rights that sit above the garage and the garage was actually constructed to carry a building on top. And so we have what oh, are okay. called air rights. So you could build a residential unit or an office unit above. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the next slide recaps uh, Prosper Portland's uh, city budget requests that were part of the requested budget that was uh, in submitted in uh, January. Um, so summarizing uh, the requests, it included $884,000 uh, for city general fund one-time resources that included uh, supporting ask around a neighborhood prosperity network service levels, uh, Old Town Community Association, uh, Portland Film Office, uh, capital access advisor, and scaling BIPOC technology firms. There was also a $504,000 um, request for uh, cannabis funds, additional cannabis funds, expanding business advising and digital marketing support. And then finally, uh, the American Rescue Plan. This is the round two resources uh, related to the American Rescue Plan. Uh, in total, was about a $28 million request uh, that included small business stabilization, um, workforce, and Venture Portland packages. I think uh, what was uh, what was uh, submitted after the budget work session was an additional $5 million uh, request for Broadway Quarter. That, so that's part of the total $28 million that's being considered for American Rescue Plan. Slide, please. Thanks. So in March, March was very busy um, with a series of work sessions on the budget with City Council. Um, so council held a series of work sessions that focused on uh, a number of council budget priorities. Uh, Prosper Portland and city bureaus jointly presented on each topic in a very coordinated approach. Uh, Prosper Portland participated in two sessions uh, that was focused on uh, those priorities. Um, on March 17th, uh, Prosper Portland participated uh, in the supporting uh, livable community, I'm sorry, supportable, supporting livable neighborhood work session in partnership with the Bureau of um, Planning and Sustainability, Parks, Transportation, uh, Development Services, Civic Life. Um, one of the key parts of that was um, showing how uh, the packages from the different bureaus um, supported um, implementing complete, complete communities, livable neighborhoods uh, that was really anchored in the 2035 comprehensive plan. And a key portion of that for Prosper Portland was presenting the ARPA American Rescue Plan request for um, about $4.5 million uh, supporting vibrant neighborhoods and business districts. And on March 31st, Prosper Portland led uh, the multi-bureau presentation on uh, economic stabilization and recovery. And this was in partnership with uh, the Bureau of Development Services, uh, Children's Levy, Work Systems Inc., uh, Venture Portland, um, identifying um, and programming requests for general fund, cannabis, and American Rescue Plan resources supporting economic recovery. And that included um, reviewing Prosper Portland's request for um, the Portland Film Office, the Neighborhood Prosperity Network, Inclusive Business Resource Network, 
as well as a $10 million American Rescue Plan request for a small business stabilization grants. And then actually preceding the two budget work sessions, the first work session was focused on, on March 14th, uh, returning tax increment funds to the city. In that session, the city of Portland office management finance and the budget office led a work session that was um, identifying the amount of tax increment resources from the expiring tax districts that were coming back to the city, the city general fund over the next 10 years and different scenarios for which um, those resources could be potentially spent on. Um, and one scenario that was presented was a 50% request of those resources for uh, economic development and affordable housing. Um, split 25% for economic development, administered by Prosper Portland, and 25% for the Housing Bureau. And that, based on the current forecast, uh, would be about $8 million for economic development starting in fiscal year 24-25, based on the current forecast, which is, is subject to change based on the forecast of those districts, as well as the um, existing commitments for expenditures within the city general fund. It was really setting the stage for uh, what resources were coming back and what options were available for those resources for city council to consider. Next slide, please. The point of clarification, these are the, those are the boomerang funds, is that what you're referring to? No. Yes. Yeah. There's, based on our last, last briefing, there's a, a, a appropriate term, a motion to sequester them. Is that, is that the appropriate? So set them aside so they're not mixed in with the rest of the general fund. That's right, Commissioner. So at the work session, uh, the Office of Management and Finance and the City Budget Office um, put forward a proposal slash recommendation um, or something for council to consider that would sequester those funds. Um, and... So I think if that were um, to happen, that would probably be done through a budget note in the proposed or uh, adopted budget this year. So over the last few months, um, after receiving stakeholder input and uh, reviewing forecasts for uh, multiple budgets, um, staff have been working on um, including different updates to what will be the proposed budget that's presented to city council. Um, that includes uh, updating our property management, lending, and property redevelopment expenditures. Um, that will include mainly looking at the tax increment districts and identifying based on what activities are happening this year versus next year and what resources might need to move from this year to next year. So largely technical adjustments uh, no uh, significant reprogramming to different priorities, but just rather a timing change between um, when activities are occurring. One example would be uh, demolition of the um, post office and the post office site, uh, moving a substantial portion of resources allocated to that demolition from this fiscal year to next fiscal year to make sure there's adequate budget appropriation next fiscal year. We are looking at property management revenues and expenditures. I don't have... Um, all the changes compiled as of today, but I really look forward to bringing that back to, um, to you when the board is um, considering the budget for adoption on June 7th to look at any updates uh, to operations since we last reviewed that back in January during the work session. Uh, from a high level review of the potential changes, uh, there's nothing significant from what we reviewed um, as far as revenues or expenditures on property management from, from January. There's still a upward trend in, in revenues over the next few years projected and um, somewhat stabilizing of expenditures. Uh, most of the programmatic, I'm sorry, take a step back here. Um, there's staffing and overhead expenditures. Um, those expenditures are largely aligned with what we reviewed uh, in January, staying within the um, amount of $3.6 million for um, um, IT facilities, other internal expenses that's um, aligned with what we have or what we carry in our financial sustainability plan as a, a standard amount. And our staffing and overhead expenditures are consistent with the, with the CBA agreement, which includes a 4% COLA. Uh, there are some resource updates that we're looking at, uh, mainly um, around Gateway. Um, we are in the process right now of selling um, 
free to market bonds in cooperation with the city of Portland, uh, with the Gateway District. Um, we were estimating about $28 million in new resources from those bonds in the budget. Uh, based on the current underwriting, that's going to climb to about $35 million, so better, better terms that will be in the budget and five-year forecast for additional resources in Gateway. But property sales, mainly in the River District, we had about $13 million for property sales. We are going to push those out a year um, to have a more conservative timing related to when certain properties, for example, Centennial Mills and others, might, might, be, um, might be sold. It could happen earlier, but we're just being more conservative on the timing. And finally, um, the mayor's proposed budget, as I mentioned, um, general fund, cannabis, uh, American Rescue Plan, uh, we'll be updating the numbers in the budget in the next week as soon as we, we receive the mayor's proposals. Next slide, please. This, is, this slide is just a recap of um, what I started with, with, the process of where we've been and, and where we're going. And um, as I mentioned, we hope to see the mayor's uh, decisions here in the next week and uh, present the budget to council on May 4th. And uh, there will be deliberation on that budget and final approval uh, by council on the 18th. And I'm happy to take any additional questions. Great, thank you, Tony. That was a great presentation, and thank you for your hard work. It's an especially difficult cycle right now, so much much appreciated. Any questions? Yeah, just so I can follow the process a little bit more clearly. My understanding is, correct me if I'm wrong, would prefer that council sequesters the boomerangs. That decision is made at the next council meeting or prior, it is just so I understand kind of the sequence of events. So there are probably a number of different ways that it could happen, but I think um, we would anticipate that um, what they would do is, and Tony can, um, can correct me on my budget language for this, but basically they need to direct the city budget office um, to, um, and the revenue division to create a separate fund, right? So city council would need to do that, and they probably could do that um, uh, to direct that that work start through a budget note, and then there would probably need to be some action that would follow up on that. Um, oh, sorry, my father is in surgery, so I need to take this. Thanks. I'll be right back. Sorry, go ahead. So that's, that's the potential course of action would be putting the funds when they become available in a separate in a separate fund for council to take action on at a later at a later stage, and then that would give us the opportunity to present our, based upon the mayor's proposed budget, our amended ask, right? And then we would argue, you know, hopefully convincingly for our share of those sequestered funds, right? right? And, it, and commissioner, at this stage right now, there's um, the city budget office is not forecasting any available returning tax increment dollars until 20, fiscal year 24-25. So potentially um, there would be no funds being moved into this separate fund or an allocation until that point. However, if the forecast change, it could be sooner. There could be additional resources based on either um, the city general fund commitments going down or potentially tax increment resources becoming returning to the city earlier because the forecast does change. But would that affect your budget as it as it is by it not having any changes until then? Yeah, Commissioner, it would... Um, by them not making a decision until 24 or 25. Right. There would be no changes to the budget. Okay. Yeah. It wouldn't hurt. <laughs> I'm just making sure. <laughs> there's... there's um, that's a great question because I think... Um, over our five-year forecast, what we were looking at um, was uh, a need of additional resources um, from the city and um, other elements of the, of the proposed financial sustainability plan, like return on investment and other components to help um, provide additional funding for operations, not necessarily next fiscal year, but in this fiscal year, uh, 23, 24, 24, 25 is, is a critical year. And right. so that's, that's where it would really come in. Right, because I know there's predicted to not be any money around during that time. So that's <laughs> so why I'm asking. Um, and so do you foresee um, for property that a prosper Portland owns that we could be doing, possibly doing better during that time as more and more people 
come back to different places and are out more as far as parking, different things like that, hotel usage. So that's why I ask. So you foresee that coming back within the next year, but also being that hold on that. Yeah, absolutely. That's a major component is that additional resources from those assets from property could um, really bridge that bridge that and add additional resources to the budget um, above and beyond what's currently in there. So we could come out looking much, much better. Yes. Yeah. Always being optimistic, so. <laughs> 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 well, and um, sorry that I had to step out for just a second, but um, you know, I think, Commissioner, we do need to um, make plans. And so part of the importance of us understanding this year where we are from a general fund resource um, is just being able to forecast um, and to be able to, you know, we have to make tough decisions to do so in a planful way. Um, so that's part of our, you know, I think Tony and the team do, does, um, they just do a fantastic job and we budget conservatively. Um, so hopefully we will exceed our expectations, but, um, you know, we can't count on resources that we aren't 100% confident and so in making staff allocation decisions, budget uh, or business line decisions, we're really hopeful that we'll have some additional certainty on that ongoing operating revenue because um, as you can imagine, you know, the other kinds of revenue can be bumpy um, and harder to plan for. So, yeah. In an ideal circumstance, how much just how much would you want to get back specifically for economic development initiatives? Because I so, think that's the yeah, that's so the piece that the, referencing what you were speaking to the, earlier, we need boots on the ground, right. full time that's hired right. folks to do that. Right? Yeah. So, um, so Commissioner, what we put forward or um, what OMF and CBO presented on our, presented on our behalf was that we would um, hope to have 25% of the boomerang resources go to economic development by way of Prosper Portland, um, and then 25% for the Housing Bureau. Um, you know, our fates are very much intertwined. Um, they're also impacted by the TIF cliff. Um, but I wanna be transparent that that really maintains level of service. So that is not expanding, um, right? So that's not greatly exceeding what we currently have. Um, so I think if we were to, um, you know, want to have even more services, which very well we, we might want to, um, we're gonna need to look at um, additional federal resources or other sorts of public-private partnerships or other innovative solutions in order to continue to, or new TIF districts in order to continue to have new resources above just um, kind of maintaining the capacity that we have right now for our key programs, the Inclusive Business Resource Network, Neighborhood Prosperity Initiative District, um, our small grants program. So, so in an ideal world, you know, I would take 100%, but, um, <laughs> but, but you know, I, I think um, we, we would be able to really have a um, high functioning economic development agency at 25%. And is there anything, I mean, just speaking uh, kind of on behalf of the other commissioners, is there anything we could do to, in terms of even you know, testimony or just showing up and to help? Yeah, let's strategize. Okay, any other comments? All right, well, thank you, Tony. Great job. Yep. Thanks very much. We'll see you in, in June <laughs> with the budget. All right, well, if there are no further items on the agenda or nobody has any more comments, then uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.